Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. <clears throat> I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday to you and yours. We made it. We made it through another week. We're blessed. We're honored. We're happy the weekend. NFL football uh, with important games to end the regular season with a lot of playoff implications. The Tennessee Titans are going to get eliminated from the playoffs by the Jacksonville Jaguars. I know Pastor Anthony is happy about that. He gave up on the pan on the Titans, you know, months ago when I told him. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pastor Anthony in studio with me for today's entire show. We're doing a Friday edition of Tennessee Harmony, and we're doing a special version of Tennessee Harmony where we're talking about the new year. This has been the new year week. We started out the week on Tuesday, and there was such major news around Monday Night Football and DeMar Hamlin that we didn't get to do the show we wanted to do on Tuesday was talk about the new year, why we're optimistic about the new year, why we are, what our intentions are and what our vision is for the new year. We wanted to do that first when we came back from break. DeMar Hamlin happened, we had to adjust. And so now we're doing it at the end of the week. Pastor Anthony, gracious enough to sit in with me throughout this show, but we're gonna hear from not just Anthony, Shamika Michelle, Dave Shannon, TJ Moe, Virgil Walker, Royce White, Steve Kim, all of our regular contributors will be here except for Delano, Professor D couldn't make it today. I'm sorry, we'll have to hear about what his, well, he wrote about earlier this week, what his vision, what, what do you say? We must protect this house, protect this house, I think is his vision for 2023. And it, it's, it's about <clears throat> men stepping up and protecting the women and children in their home, protecting that family unit that God feels is so important. That's what Delano is focusing in on in 2023. He wrote about it earlier this week uh, for The Blaze. I wanna take a moment here and explain to you all what the vision for Fearless is this year in 2023, because we're gonna take things to the next level but because we're combining this with Tennessee Harmony and because Pastor Anthony's just here, I wanna start with a prayer and bless our entire show and conversation and hope that it glorifies and brings honor to God. But I wanna let our resident expert, our spiritual leader, Anthony Walker, uh, start us off with a prayer. Please do. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful for uh, today, we're thankful that you've brought us into a new year. Thankful for this show. Thankful for those who uh, contribute. Thankful uh, mostly for Jason and the vision that he has uh, for this show and this platform. We're thankful for those who watch us uh, each and every day. Thankful for their support. Father, we're praying for this year, praying that uh, the things that we aspire to do and hope to do this year are aligned with your will and your way that are pleasing and acceptable to you. Uh, we're praying for blessings for Jason uh, because of the stances that he take and standing on the truth, Father. We know it takes courage. And so we pray for him and uh, for uh, strength and courage in standing and also for protection because we know the enemy uh, is busy. We're praying for all of the contributors. Uh, just praying for a great outlook on this year uh, and that all that we do brings you glory and honor. Bless today's show uh, as we discuss some of the vision and plans that we have on this year. We pray that it is beneficial. We're thankful in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> that's a great launching point for me to let me give me 10, 15 minutes to tell you guys about what we're planning to do here at Fearless and why we're planning to do it. And, and it's consistent, I think, with the vision we articulated 18, 19 months ago when this started. This, this has always been the mission, but you have to lay a foundation and put it in place before you can really execute and realize your vision. And that's what I think we have done over the course of 18 months. We discovered Anthony. I 
knew T.J. Moe a little bit from his playing days and knew who he was, but now T.J. Moe has become one of my best friends, a partner for me in this, in executing this vision at, at Fearless, and Delano and, and Virgil Walker and Shamika Michelle, all of these guys, new friends of mine, new partners with me on executing this vision. Steve Kim, I knew Steve Kim, but I didn't know that me and Steve Kim would hit it off and have the kind of chemistry that we do in talking sports and, and different things. I think God has moved things in an incredible way and in a fast way of putting the right foundation around me, the blaze, this whole fearless movement to where now we can take things to a higher level. And the reason why we need to take things to a higher level, and again, this is what I'm saying, consistent with my vision from the very beginning and almost, and this, when I say from the very beginning, I'm talking about, you go back to me at age 13, 14, 15 years old. I've always had a very healthy skepticism of the power of politics and politicians. And people, my family's been upset with me. Many of you all have been upset with me. I've never voted. I registered to vote for the midterms and I plan to vote in 2024. But I've always been very skeptical of politics and politicians. It's not my passion. I don't believe in it. When I was in high school, I was a member of our student council and I saw the kind of shenanigans and the, just the pettiness and, and all of that that went on with a student, student council and decisions weren't really made in the best interest of the student body. And I'm not, even, I'm not bad mouthing the kids I went to high school with or that were on the student council, but I could just see how like, oh, these decisions aren't really about the whole student body. They're about the people on the student council and how it makes them look, how it makes their college resumes look, how it enhances their popularity at school. And so I've always been very skeptical of politics. And if you saw me on Tucker Carlson's show, I think last week, late last week, uh, Tulsi Gabbard was sitting in for Tucker Carlson and she brought me on to talk about George Santos politician out of New York, caught in a bunch of lies, won't really admit to them, won't take responsibility. And this is a Republican politician in New York that won't take responsibility. And I went on the show, or her, on, on the show that day and talked about how we have spiritual problems in America, not political problems. We do have political problems, but they're rooted in a spiritual and moral decay. And if that spiritual issue is not fixed, the politics are always going to be rotten. And the politicians, whether Republican or Democrat, are always going to be rotten. And you can sit there, and I know I'm going to irritate some of you and say, well, our rotten politicians are better than their rotten politicians. That's what both sides argue. I argue both sides, politicians are rotten and they're doing things in their own self-interest more than the interests of the people. And we won't get anything different from politicians until we correct ourselves, until we correct the spiritual and moral decay that we have in this country. And as you've listened to me talk on this show, I've copped to, I've admitted and talked extensively about, whoo, I was a big part of that moral decay. I was a participant in that moral decay. We have to do better or we're going to continue to lose this country and the things that I grew up loving about this country. The reason why free speech is under attack is because there's a moral decay, a spiritual decay, rotting or even respect for freedom. People don't even understand the value of freedom because of our spiritual decay. We're so disconnected from God's vision, plan, scriptures, gospel, 
wisdom. I may be repeating myself, but we're just so disconnected from a biblical worldview that the things that we create are poisonous and don't serve us well. And so I was on Tucker Carlson's show like, hey, George Santos, I don't care that he's a Republican. This man won't cop to what he did wrong, won't repent, won't ask for forgiveness, won't, won't acknowledge his mistake. This is our problem. And there are no political solutions to spiritual problems. And then, <clears throat> I believe shortly after that, Donald Trump tweeted out a criticism of the pro-life movement, blamed the pro-life crowd for a poor performance for the Republicans and for conservatives in the midterm elections. And the, again, I've never voted, I've, but I've always been critical. I, I really don't have a problem with, with Donald Trump. Uh, I love his America first agenda because my family, my parents grew up factory workers, raised us as factory workers, and he was talking about manufacturing jobs and all that other stuff. But over the course of his involvement in politics, Donald Trump has become a politician at this point, and he's worried about himself. He's not worried about the American people. He's not worried about anything other than his own legacy. He's turned into a politician. When you take a dump on the pro-life evangelical crowd, you're taking a dump on me, and you're taking a dump on people that I really just don't think are part of the problem. I, I, really, I don't think they're blameless, I don't think they're perfect by any stretch, but those of us with those values, evangelicals, pro-life, to have Donald Trump take a dump on us when, again, I haven't voted, but many of you have in that pro-life crowd, that he now wants to take a dump and point a finger at you. It's not me, it's you. You guys are the problem. That's why we lost the midterm election. It was just another reminder to me, don't put your faith in politicians. I never have, I never will. If we want to save this country, if we want to improve this country, it has to be us. It has to quit looking for someone other than yourself to improve this country. It starts with you. Not with Donald Trump, not with Joe Biden, not with Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, it, Kanye West. It doesn't start with LeBron James. It doesn't, whatever billionaire you can think of, it doesn't start with them. It starts with you and it starts with us. And it starts primarily, and most importantly, with men. And so the mission, the vision for 2023 is to take this show, Fearless, that we've been doing for 18 months, we built up a nice following, we found the right contributors, I found the right soldiers, I found the right supporters and subscribers in you, but now we have to move from being passive viewers of the show that just watch the show. We can't even, we, we have to move from just being Jason Whitlock, host of this show, uh, Delano, TJ Moe, contributor to the show. We have to move beyond that to trying to raise up, elevate, inspire men to bear witness to a truth that I think many of us believe in, that Jesus Christ was sent here as our Lord and Savior and we have to bear witness to that and not be silenced by our sin. Bearing witness requires courage, not perfection. And so my focus and the focus on this show in 2023 is going to be to start the movement, to take fearless from a show to a movement where men and women supporters, but primarily men, we want to gather together encourage each other, learn from each other, socialize with each other, build a fraternity among us, and basically I wanna pick up, I, 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 you know, 
I don't want to, I'm very authentic. I'm, I'm not, my ego's not wrapped up in this. I want to pick up where the Promise Keepers and Bill McCartney, the Colorado football coach that started the Promise Keepers, I want to pick up where they left off. They were very powerful in the 90s. We want to do that. We want to connect fellow believers, fellow people, biblical worldview people. We want to give you the confidence and the tools and the information and the support you need to stand on the truth spelled out in the Bible. And so in come April 15th, we're doing the first Fearless Men's Summit. We're calling it Roll Call. It will be the first of many roll calls. We're inviting you to Nashville to come fellowship with us, hear us speak. We're gonna break bed. We'll listen to some music. Myself, Anthony, Bobby Harrington, TJ Moe, Delano Squires, we're going to speak. We'll have some performances, but it's going to be our first gathering of calling you into this movement and asking you to join with us in promoting men who are willing to embrace a righteous life, not a perfect life, but we have to live more righteously. That's the only way we can combat this culture. If you think, oh, let me wait until I get perfect and then I'll join. No, I need you to join us and let God perfect you through the process. That's what Christianity is. It's not, well, once I get perfect, then I'll go. You know, once I quit cheating on my wife, then I'll go. Once I get my drinking problem under control or my weed problem under control or whatever my vice is under control, then I'll join. The process is bring all of your problems and vices to God. He will fix them. You will improve and you will get better. We want you imperfect. If you right now are watching this show, drunk and or high, you're exactly who I want to come to Nashville, as long as you believe in God. Because God will take those vices up off of you. He will improve you. But you have to be willing just to be courageous, not perfect. I want you to join us April 15th here in Nashville as we transition from a show to a movement, and to a, a tool used to inspire men to be better. Because if we get better as men, watch what happens in this country. The world, this country will get better. And we don't, it doesn't need to start out as some massive thing. Well, if we don't have two million people, if we don't have 100,000 people, we don't have 50,000 people. No, nah, man, if it's just two or three of us, there will be more. But if it's, it, it just starts with one domino falling. When I've been amazed over the course of the 18 months of doing this show, and even before they're doing this show, I've been amazed at how many of my friends have watched the transformation in me and started a, saying, what are you doing? I wanna do that. Hey, can we talk about the Bible? And these are guys that, all I did with really was drink, socialize, and chase. These dudes, they stepping out of the clubs. They're stepping out of, like, I don't want to tell everybody's business, but just they're stepping, chasing women's not the most important thing to them anymore. And it's because they've sat and watched what's going on with me and it's tickled an itch that they've been longing to scratch. They wanted to do better. It's like, if Whitlock can do it, holy cow, I can do it. You can be that for us in your community. That's what we want to insp inspire in, with this fearless movement. If we can do that, if we can just reach one or two of you in every city, you'll be shocked what will happen to your friends and the people around you and the thoughts and the transformation that will go along with them. And then once men start transforming themselves, the worlds around us will change. Our church will change. Our schools will change. Our relationships 
with wives, girlfriends, children, parents, whom will all change. My brother and sister and my mother will tell you, they may not all understand my, their perceived view of, of how I feel about politics, but they'll tell you like, whoo, man, look at it, Jason. He's a much better brother, son, everything through this transformation that I've, they've been bearing with, been watching and witnessing, and, and they love it. I'm more available, I'm more accessible, I'm more engaged, I'm more involved. It can happen for you. And so we want you to join us in April. There's other things we're planning to do uh, beyond just the roll call because there's an information war that we want to get involved in. Matt Walsh's What is a Woman Project has inspired me. And I think there's a way for us here at Fearless to do a documentary that will help tell the, the overall story that I've been explaining on this show throughout this 18 months about how America has lost its moral compass. And it, its moral compass has been righteous, religious, God-fearing men. We've lost that. Black men in particular, but all men, but black men in particular have been emasculated. We have been the moral compass for America. It's been stripped away from America and that's why America is lost. This movement here has no racial idolatry. It's for everybody. But there is, because of the dynamics in this country, because of the racial idolatry in this country, because of the way corporate media has been used, the way white evangelicals have been demonized as racist, it's going to take a God-fearing black man, God, uh, a, a, a black-led movement to get America to wake up and return to a biblical worldview. We want to be at the forefront of that uh, with the fearless movement and with the roll call movement. That's our vision. We want you to go to, let me make sure I, I get this right. I'm old, and so uh, I want to direct you to our website for the roll call, fearlessarmyrollcall.com, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Once you here in April, and Nashville is a great, fun place. We're going to have some fun on that Saturday. We'll do some little special events on Friday as well. Look forward to connecting with you, inspiring you. Look forward to putting a dog tag on you. Because <laughs> right, we want, we're going to have dog tags. I'm gonna, you'll see me start wearing these roll call dog tags. And on the back of it, it's going to say, bearing witness requires courage, not perfection. Don't let your sin silence you. Let God liberate you from your sin and elevate your voice so that you're a power player in your community. We're gonna build up men here uh, with this show and with this movement. We're ready for the movement. We hope that you will join us. Uh, again, Anthony here uh, is gonna be a big part of, of what we're doing in April. and He's already a big part. He helps us in many ways, both on and off the air. Um, and so the rest of this show, I'm going to invite Anthony and the other contributors to come on the show and talk about what their vision is uh, for 2023, what they're focused in on. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna transition and Anthony you can talk a little bit about our vision here at Fearless and, and share what, what you're gonna be focusing on as a leader in your community and family or, or whatever. Wow, man. I don't, I don't know whether you need a microphone, a podium, or a pulpit after that. <laughs> I mean, you really, <laughs> you really laid it down. That was very inspiring. Um, you know, the, one of the efforts that I try to really emphasize in my ministry uh, is empowering men. Um, God showed us the blueprint in his word that the most powerful being on the planet is a man that stands with God. When you've got God with you as a man, there's nothing that cannot be conquered. There's nothing that cannot be overcome. There's nothing that can hold you back. 
And when God gives you a vision and, and empowers you as a man, I mean, the doors have to come down. So, you know, one of the things about this roll call that really excites me is that it is about energizing and encouraging and enriching men. Uh, you know, the world has this culture right now that is doing the best it can to beat men down, you know, just to make you feel because of some things you've done in the past, because of some failures you've had. It just kind of beats men down and then men begin to view themselves in that same way that maybe I'm not uh, as valuable. Maybe I can't contribute as much. And so if there's an effort that's around that is about strengthening and encouraging and uplifting men, I really want to be a part of that. And, and when men are strengthened, it trickles down to everything else. There's research that shows that, you know, when we do a lot of things that we can do for kids, especially churches, as they try to cater to kids, there's a percentage of families that come when kids are involved. There's a percentage of families that come when uh, the mother is involved. But when a father commits his way to God, when he's the first one that shifts his family to a church, shifts his family to a God direction, 95% of the time the family comes with him. So it is really about strengthening these men. And so I'm excited about uh, the roll call. Uh, as it relates to this show, you know, when we go back to the very beginning, I remember the first time that I came on, one of the directives that you gave me was, hey, I just want you to give a biblical perspective to contemporary issues. And, and for me, where that's kind of comfortable for me is that's that's my wheelhouse. That's what we do as ministers. We try to bring God's word to whatever situation we have. And with every situation, be it, you know, politics, be it sports, be it cultural issues, I've had an opportunity to do that. But one of the things that's really encouraged me is that it's not just about what you talk about on air. It's it's about the entire life. Like even when the cameras go off, we're still talking about the same stuff. We're still dealing with God's word, uh, even in our prayer calls, in our Bible studies, uh, off air, like that encourages us and it uplifts us, it strengthens us because God's word, that's what it's all about. And then that translates to the show and it's my prayer and hope that that even translates to the viewers. And I believe it does. The fact that so many are viewing and, and so many followers are coming along, I think that that really uh, contributes. But as it relates to some of my focuses for this year, I couldn't whittle it down to one primary focus. I have four key interests of era, uh, areas rather that I think we need to touch on in this year. Discipleship. Um, you hear that term a lot, but we really have to get back. This is the primary goal that Christ gave the entire church just before uh, ascending back. He says, I want you to go into the world and make disciples. We have become a society that has gotten comfortable in uh, weekend church, you know, just just tuning in, watching the Sunday experience. Some churches have a Saturday experience and that's it. But the real method is disciple making. A disciple learns to follow, learns to follow who? Jesus. But that same disciple follows to learn. We have to keep following him. And then we recognize that no matter how much I grow, no matter how strong I get, there's always room. So that's where I get that phrase. A disciple learns to follow, follows to learn, but never arrives. So we've got to get back as churches. Yes, have a thriving uh, worship ministry, have some uh, great programs that cater and serve. But we got to get to our primary goal, which is making disciples. Another key area is church involvement. Again, uh, the statistics show it, it's all a quick Google search. You can see there's been a decline of uh, Bible reading of church attendance. But right around the pandemic and you can remember one of the first times I was on air, you had asked me about, you know, some of the things that was plaguing the church at the time. And it is involvement. I mean, it just it went off a cliff not just for, you know, black churches or, or, or white churches. It, it's across the board. 
And so what we've got to do now is, again, reinforce that involvement. We are the body of Christ. We are members of the body, not members like a gym membership. We are members like an organ, like like a finger, like a leg. We are connected. And so we really got to get back to being involved. Quit sending your kids, bring your kids, quit uh, sitting and letting the wife take the kids to Bible class. You get up and do that as well. You be involved in Bible study. Men, you be involved in teaching Bible studies, in leading ministries. So we got to get on church involvement. Uh, growth of men and great men, godly men standing. We really got to get back to and that's what the roll call is about. You know, men standing up after being beaten down and hit with what the world has done and the culture war. Just stand up. Standing up alone is, is victory in so many cases. So we got to get back to godly men standing. Uh, I'm not going to let this happen to my kids. I'm not going to let this happen to my marriage. I'm not going to let the enemy destroy what God has built around me. And lastly, uh, I'm, I'm working on some efforts and I'm praying about this, but we got to get godly families to become the norm. Like that just needs to be the average. Uh, you know, I, I, society is doing everything it can to redefine and create all kinds of words to, you know, birthing people and identifying or presenting male. Look, let's get back to what God has designed as the family. One man, one woman for life that are loving God, loving one another, loving and raising godly children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. When that becomes the norm uh, and, and if we work towards that becoming the norm, these are all steps that will change and transform the world. Last thing I'll say, we are at a crux in our society that some may consider very critical. Um, our trust in politicians as a whole is going down. Our trust in our um, economy, you know, the way things are going with that, all that's going down. And you would say with all these things going down, who can we turn to for the truth, for direction, for guidance, for rebuilding? And as you pointed out, before we can do anything with the culture war, we've got to start fortifying and fighting the spiritual war. So we got to get back to God's word, word and, and change this world to what he wants it to be. All right. So we're going to bring in Shamika Michelle next, but we're going to play for you before she, she comes on the commercial we have put together for Roll Call. And again, the website is fearlessarmyrollcall.com. I need you to join up for the Fearless Army and come join us in April. But go to the website. Here's the commercial. Shamika Michelle, next. Atheists, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take, shut up. You, you're, you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men. We know you're imperfect, you know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy, mercy gives you the right to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture. We, we have to do that. You can look around and say, these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president. Is transgender surgery for children? Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're gonna stop fighting today and you're gonna let the government raise your kids and you're gonna turn around and let them chop off your 12 year old daughter's breasts and let them sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl and you're gonna let them make the Bible hate speech. You're the last line of defense here because nobody else is gonna do it and God's gonna walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. Absolutely. I'm telling you, so it's like everybody, it's a nice little metaphor. This is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedroom. And there are all types of people that are trying to climb up in the ladder. 
and every good father should be on his post so that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know, you, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough. In prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ. I appreciate that, but <laughs> to have Jesus pray for me, that makes me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, go back and strengthen your brothers. So we all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folk out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone, be confident in your positions, and we're gonna inspire you. We're gonna eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's gonna be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're gonna put put on our best uh, recruiting pitches for soldiers. Yeah. All right, welcome back. Time for Shamika Michelle and to hear her New Year's, I don't want to call it a resolution, vision, area of focus, what does she think is most important for us in 2023. Shamika, Happy New Year. Welcome back to the show. What do you see, what do you want to see in 2023? Happy New Year, Jason. You know, when I started this show, I said that I don't want to identify as anything. I said, if anything, I'm a fruit inspector and I don't care what you claim to be. If you're a Christian, I'm going to be looking for the fruit. If you claim to be a Muslim, I'm looking for the fruit. And what I have seen over the last year and actually over the last three years are a bunch of people that are not showing any real fruit of what they claim to believe. And you know, Jason, that I walked away from the ministry, but lately I have felt like a rock crying out in the place of people who claim God has put a call on their life to preach or to teach or evangelize, you know, and it's bothered me so bad that what I believe I'm going to do in 2023 is be the loudest rock. If I'm going to have to be the rock to speak up for people that claim that they have a calling on their life, but they're sitting silent in the church, sitting silent in the pulpit, going to Golden Corral every Sunday with their collar on and their cross chain tucked in their pocket, I'm going to be the loudest rock. rock a -bye baby. The rock that can't be moved. And that's what I feel like we have to do in 2023 and going forward is actually speak up and speak out in what we claim to believe. And, and what I'm, I'm not interested in is I'm not interested in people coming on my timeline and in my mentions and saying, you know, your, your message could be a lot more effective if you just Watched your mouth. It was if it was just a little cleaner. You want my message to be cleaner? Then you give it. But as long as you are sitting holding your peace, what I'm gonna do is speak up and speak out. I'm gonna cry loud and spare not. I'm not gonna hold back because we have children being mutilated. We have children being taught that they can't be anything because of the color of their skin. So I ain't got time to tiptoe in 2023. I'm not tiptoeing. I'm going going full throttle. And if you don't like it, speak out in my place because you're the one that claimed God has a calling on your life to preach. You're a preacher. Let me hear it. You're a prophet. Let me see it. You're an evangelist. Then let me watch you go ye therefore and teach all nations. If you're not doing what you claim God has called you to do, shut up and stop thinking you're going to critique what I'm 
what I'm doing, what I believe I'm supposed to do in this earth realm. So in 2023, that's what I'm going to do, Jason. I'm going to be the loudest rock and I'm going to cry loud and spare not. I'm not going to be nice. I'm not holding back because we're in a war and we, we, we got too much to lose, too much on the line. And I think this show is so important and what we are doing is so important. I feel a fire to, to, to just continue to be fearless. So that that's what I'm doing in 2023, Jason. I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> you, that was a great fire starter. Uh, you may need to be the host of this show. And <laughs> you did that off the top of your head. That is awesome. Uh, I gotta say, Shamika, and you know, I got I'm telling you this like you're my younger sister. You're coming into 23 looking amazing. Uh, you know, it's like you're getting younger uh, in right before our eyes. So, Thank you know, you. you're, you're going to be a loud rock, but you're going to be looking good in 23 as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. That was Shamika Michelle. We'll roll out to Idaho and hear from Dave Shannon. X. All right, let's roll out to Idaho, bring in Chocolate Knox, Dave Shannon, the Idaho potato. Dave, 2023, what you focusing on? Man, Shamika Michelle gave me the goosebumps, man. I feel the spirit. I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling it right now. You know, uh, I better cry loud and spare not after that. I hate coming after her, but I got three R's that I'm focusing on. I'm going to focus on repentance of sin, uh, re- rest- restoration, And the last one, Jason, is (laughs) remembrance. Uh, I think that America right now, particularly as I look at myself, man, there's a lot of sin that we need to repent of. And if we don't get restored hearts that turn back to God and repent of the fact that we don't honor God with all of our heart, that we have idols that we place before him, the fact that we have coveted our neighbor's things and haven't been a good neighbor, that we haven't been good children, good husbands and good fathers, if we don't repent of those sins and ask God for a restorated heart, then we're not going to be able to accomplish anything in this next year or be able to save the current situation that we're in. So we better start repenting of our sins first and foremost. And Jason, the next thing after repentance of sins, then you're ready for restoration. I've been thinking a lot about this. We need to restore our loves. I don't want to be known as a person who fights against what he hates, but a man that fights for what he loves instead. We need to restore our love for God first, the God who has made us and brought us out of the land of Egypt and has purified us and made us whole and given all these lovely blessings to us. And the next thing after that, Jason, is we need to remember the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment is so essential in this next battle. Honoring your father and mother and restoring the love of husband and wife um, is essential because everything that comes out of the home is a microcosm of what happens in the culture. If we don't get the hierarchical structure right in the home, then everything we see in the culture, if you just look at it right now, if you want to know what our culture was, what the home culture was yesteryear, you can look at the culture right now and it'll tell you what our home culture was yesteryear. And if you want to know what the culture of the future is going to be, all you have to do right now is take the temperature of the homes that we're currently in. And so getting the orders and structures and hierarchical loves right in my home, that is going to be the number one thing I focus on. There is a scene in uh, Ninja Turtles where Michelangelo, the old Ninja Turtles, I'm an older guy, so I like the old Ninja Turtles. Michelangelo is fighting And he hits a dude in the head with nunchucks and he looks at his power of what he's doing while he's in the middle of the fight. And he says, oh, God, I love being a turtle. And that is the kind of thing that I want to make sure that I am doing in my home is making sure that my wife loves being a wife, loves being a mother. My children love being a boy love being a girl and that I love being a man that I run to the the mess that's there and cultivate joy even though we're in the middle of battle when we decide to swing our nunchucks and hit something even though we're in a fight we love the fact that we are in this fight God made us for this moment and you only do you only get to that place where you love being in the fight and you don't mind the fight when you have rightly ordered loves 
I want to make sure that my home is the kind of place that cultivates joy and happiness. I want my sons to look at me and say, Dad, I love being your, your son. You are a great father. I want my wife to look at me and say, I couldn't have married a better man. Because that kind of thing is that when I look at my sons and I treat them godly, when they go out into the workforce, they're, they're expecting that that type of situation would be the same towards to them with their hierarchical structures of their boss. They expect that their boss would look at them with the same type of love of their father and want the best for them. And I want them to think of themselves as employees and say, I want the very best for my boss. And that type of relationship changes everything. We don't need unions at that point. We don't need other people to intervene because of the love between the two. And so Whatever relationship that my children find themselves in, I want them to either be on top where they have hierarchical structures of leadership, where they think the best of the people who are working for them and that they think about supplying them with the the very best work, the very best pay. Uh, But that all comes because my home is structured in such a way that it develops that type of culture. And so a restoration of loves that we fight for what's behind us and not just the evil that's in front of us. And the last thing, Jason, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I, had, the, the, I got something, but go ahead. Yeah, okay, I didn't want to interrupt you. But the last thing that I think is super important is remembering. This is where we take hope in remembering the gospel. Because one of the things that we need to remember about the gospel is that the gospel is designed to only save wicked people. Christ <laughs> only saves wicked people. I was on TikTok the other day, and I was watching a clip of a guy who was taking his friend to an abortion clinic and he was so jovial about it. He was very effeminate and he was doing it to try and poke at Christians. And a lot of people saw that clip and became very upset. I saw that clip and I thought, but that's the kind of people that God saves. Matter of fact, that's the only people that God saves. God only saves wicked people. And when we know that the gospel actually works on wicked people, we're not afraid of these kind of the libs of TikTok video that gets underneath our skin. Instead, we're like, oh, are you coughing? I got some medicine for that. Oh, are you broken? I got some medicine for that. Are you gay? You transsexual? I got medicine for that. We are the kind of people that need to remember the hope in the gospel. We have the medicine and we need to apply it. Mm. Very good. The, th- the thing I really liked, Anthony, the, the restoration of love is is that is part of this whole roll call thing. I'm trying to point us all towards love, praise, worship of God, Mm -hmm. because too much of politics is focused on, I hate that group and hate that side. And that hate animosity, it's limited in where it can take you and it's not gonna take you nearly as far as love. I love God and I wanna, be in obedience to his will, I wanna be aligned with him. That's really how you change things. But, but when, it's, it's, when so many people are motivated by negativity, you get what we have today. Everybody's at each other's throats. That, that, the point he brought up about love was one that got me to, you know, it's, it's a challenge to love people that love you. Uh, we all have our flaws, we all have our issues, but Jesus even ups the ante and says, I want you to love your enemies. So even his movement is based around love. The ministry is based around love. And as Dave was talking about, even the people that we see online and that we may think, oh my gosh, how could they do? How could they say that? God loves those people. And I need to love them enough to tell them the truth. I need to love them enough to be an example to them. I need to love them enough to invite them into the kingdom of God. Dave, awesome job. Thank you so much. We're gonna keep it moving. Uh, you can go to blazetv.com slash fearless. Use the promo code fearless. You can save $10 on your yearly subscription. TJ Mo, show me kid. X. I just Let's roll out to St. Louis. I was almost at Kansas City. Let's roll out to the Show Me State of Missouri. Bring in TJ Moe. TJ, what's your vision focus for 2023? 
I'm not surprised we're all on the same wavelength here, particularly uh, I'm, I'm going to restate many of the things that you did. You know, I, I think the story of 2023, certainly by the end, the national story, the political story is going to be Ron DeSantis versus Donald Trump. And I think Christians, along with everybody else, have fallen into this idea that if we just get the right politician, we can turn America around. And it is absolute nonsense. The only way we can turn America around is if Christians start applying the proper pressure. Politicians just do whatever's the most popular in their party because they all have this original platform and then you look at the end of their platform and most of the time they haven't accomplished any of that. Why is that? Because they're at the whim of whatever the, is popular in their party at the moment. And so for Christians, our, our values don't change. It's all written right in there in that book. And so all we have to do is apply that pressure and be the loudest voice. And it's like, uh, the, the way I put this is we need to be taking up space because for a long time, and I, and I don't know where this started, not old enough to know, but um, Christians have gone away. We've allowed everybody else to occupy the public square. And then when we try to enter into the public square, they throw out a scary phrase like Christian nationalism. And then we crawl back into our hole and say, I'm really sorry. I didn't, didn't mean to offend anybody. And that is the Christian uh, idea right now. It's like um, Jack Posobiec has been all over Twitter saying, we need to be taking up space. He's exactly right. We should say Merry Christmas. People make fun of that. You should say Merry Christmas. You should tell people that you're praying for them. You should ask people to pray for you. You should invite them to church. You should get your nose in that Bible and use that as your reference point instead of uh, quoting Ross and Joey from Friends. I know this show is not the right place to make that reference, but I grew up around a bunch of suburban white women. And so <laughs> quoting Friends is not the reference point, I'm telling you. Uh, Christians have got to be taking up space, particularly because we're the majority. Christians, according to the Pew Research Center, 64% of the population. Gallup poll says that the LGBT community, 7.1%. They've just hit an all-time high. That has doubled since 2012 because they are the loudest. They're actually recruiting people. They're actually turning people gay and trans. They're the loudest. They, they're so outsized in their influence, and we are so... Uh, undersized in our influence because we are the majority. So I'm going to sound like a broken record here because I've said this now for a year, but like my question will continue to be, where are the pastors? Where are the leaders? We got a whole bunch of people out there. Uh, Joe Rogan is one of these guys. I like Rogan, but he, he likes to pick fights with Christian, did it with uh, Christians, did it with Matt Walsh recently. Um, always likes to pick, why do you believe this? This is a guy who believes that the most impossibly complex system and collection of systems that, ex that, that we can't figure out still today comes from an explosion, just a random explosion. And he's laughing at us like we're the ones that don't make any sense. We should be laughing at them. These guys think, well, hey, just give us one miracle and everything makes sense. Christians should be in the middle of the public square. And in order to do that, we've got to know scripture. James 122 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Well, you got to know the Bible to do what it says. What does it say? Matthew 5, 13, be the salt of the earth. You should be the light on the hill. About every social issue that we're facing right now, the Bible's got something to say about it if you know how to apply it, apply it properly. It is clear about preserving the life of children in the womb. Jeremiah 1.5, Psalm 139. It's clear about one, what constitutes marriage. Genesis 2.24. It's clear about protecting children and what will happen to you if you cause them to stumble. Matthew 18.6. It is clear that God created only man and woman. Genesis 1.27. You have to know your scripture in order to fight this battle, and you have to know why that battle matters. So are we Christians or not? Do we actually believe what we say we believe? Because these other voices are so much louder than ours, and ours is so soft, it's like we don't even exist. So there was a time where Bibles were in schools. Benjamin Rush wrote an entire defense of this, one of our most popular founding fathers. Didn't come out of school until 1962. Look how corrupt we have become since that time. The, the, the phrase that everybody loves to throw in the face of Christians is live and let live. And I can't find that in the Bible. So I'm not going to be abiding by that. What I'm going to abide by is Matthew 5.13, where it says you are to be the salt of the earth. And so my vision for 2023 and my fearless vision is that all of us stand up and we apply the pressure necessary to start changing things or we are screwed. Mm, I can't top that. So I'm going to leave it alone. Thank you, TJ. Great job. Right. Go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit notifications and subscribe. Virgil Walker 
the bow tied bandit. Next. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Uh, let's bring in Virgil Walker. Let's head out to Atlanta. Virgil, what are you focusing on in 2023? Well, it's it's no different. Again, there's a lot of overlap with the guys. I actually reached out to uh, Pastor Anthony this morning, and I told him his list sounded so good, I was going to throw mine away and just grab his and work on that. So uh, I, I, I'll also say this. TJ Moe actually showed a little bit of his whiteness with the friends reference. I just have to put that out there before I get started with. with, (laughs) I think he's very aware of that. (laughs) (laughs) Friends and Seinfeld, two shows that I heard were great. And maybe I've watched three episodes combined. (laughs) Right, right. Right. No, listen, I, my focus has not shifted. What, what we do here uh, at G3 as, as we educate, encourage and equip uh, local churches, uh, we want to strengthen them with sound biblical theology and doctrine uh, and see them uh, be able to stand against what culture is, is, is really pushing toward us. What I'm witnessing here, Jason, this year uh, as I watched this midterm election cycle happen, as I watched the Dobbs decision take place, I had a front row seat to what's actually happening within within the four walls of the black of the so-called black church. Uh, and and it, it was absolutely mind boggling and disturbing. I think in one of the first episodes that you actually had me come uh, on to the show with uh, was a, when I wrote a letter to black church pastors. Uh, This was right after the Dobbs decision uh, when I I watched black church pastors get in the pulpit and then advocate for the culture of death that is abortion. Uh, I I was I was dumbstruck by that when historically speaking, uh, the black church was socially conservative. Uh, We we knew that that maybe economically we were looking for some free things or, or handouts from government. But socially speaking, uh, we, we stood on, on issues of marriage. Uh, we, we were against gay marriage. Uh, we stood as it pertained to issues of life. But this year, we saw the absolute opposite of that take place. Uh, it, it's been said that the black church is the conscience of the country. And, and if, if that's true, Jason, our national conf- conscience rather, is actually in the final stages of, of a cancerous demise. Far too many black pastors are actually prostituting the bride of Christ in exchange for popularity or prosperity or political favor. Uh, and, and it's absolutely unbelievable. For me, as I witness this, my focus this year is, is, is a little bit of, of what of what Shamika talked about. I'm, I'm not going to spare a, 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 anything. I'm going to be screaming. I'm going to be I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be pushing the envelope and shining the light of truth, exposing the darkness. That's a part of what's taking place within the within the church with the hope that those who see it and understand it and are called of him will come out of that of that place and walk in the light of Christ. Those are the kinds of things that that I'll be focused on in 2023. My hope is that 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 blacks in mass will abandon these false teachers and preachers and, and will actually begin walking uprightly before we actually suffer the, the the ultimate judgment of God. You've talked about this kind of thing on the show. I think that's the reason why you're doing things like the roll call. Uh, we've got to be be, be a light uh, that shines in the darkness to draw people uh, to, to the things of God, repenting of sin placing faith in Christ and the like. Secondarily, uh, I'll say this, much like Dave Shannon, uh, with all of the things that are out there in culture, I always say this, that the Bible, the word of God is first a mirror for us to examine our own selves. And then it is a window for us to examine culture. So as it pertains to Virgil and and, and what I'm doing, I'm I'm focusing on being a a better husband, a better father, a better better friend, uh, better at work, uh, better in in every facet of life uh, from a standpoint of what what God says in his word. I I really do truly believe uh, that, that God is sovereign, that the word of God is sufficient to handle every issue, and that we, his people, need to submit to what God has said in his word. Virgil, thank you. Great job. Talk to you later in the week. Virgil, very uh, involved behind the scenes with helping getting the roll call off the ground. Uh, He's kind of our brains behind the scenes. 
I, I just can't stress enough how important it is for you guys to come join us here in Nashville as we try to kick this movement off in 2023. There's other things we want to be doing. We eventually, we want to take roll call on the road and perhaps bring it to your city. But we're going to start here in Nashville where we're based. And because it has a lot of synergy with other things that, that I think music is essential to bringing people together. And, and if we got to get the roll call thing up and rolling, documentary, and, and eventually I'm going to get to this Harmony Festival. There's a reason why I've done the weekly show Tennessee Harmony is because we're going to make Tennessee the shining star as it relates to harmony, racial harmony and moving past racial idolatry. And you can only do that by putting God first, because once everybody starts worshiping, praising God, that's how we start seeing the humanity and, and that we're all image bearers of this God. And we put all these little silly surface level differences to the side. We start, oh man, that, that's my brother in Christ, regardless of color. That's where this fearless movement is going. Needs you here in Nashville with us as we get it, get it rolling. All right, we're gonna keep it rolling and uh, bring Royce White on X. All right, welcome back. Let's roll out to Morpheus, Royce White. And Royce, I've been keeping everybody tight with their vision for 2023, but I gotta, I gotta be respectful of how big your brain is. And so uh, I'm gonna give you a little extra time to unpack whatever it is you wanna unpack. Uh, the floor is yours. What's your vision? What's most important in 2023? I think the most, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think the most important thing this year is for people to realize the greatest lie we've been told in human history, um, that technology, that the internet, that social media, e-commerce, the fourth industrial revolution would connect us a world away and, and, and make, um, the world a better place would, would, would help humanity come together, would help humanity reach new heights. Um, and we've seen the exact opposite take place. Um, we feel under the, uh, you know, in, in the shadow of this, this global technocratic agenda, um, we feel more isolated and disempowered than ever before. Um, and and the, uh, the limits know no bounds, right? And the, the horizon is grim. Um, and all we can really do is, is either A, uh, reject the progression, the unchecked progression of technology, um, Altogether, or we have to be even more heroic in, in grabbing the reins of technology and shepherding it in the right in the right direction. Um, and when I see things like baby farms, ecto ecto cloning, or um, well, where we're going with artificial intelligence, uh, Neuralink, uh, all of these things are are grim. And, and we've spent a lot of time on social cultural wedge issues. You know, and, and it's not that those aren't important, but abortion, uh, uh, you know, the LGBTQ or uh, Black Lives Matter, racism, all of these things in the in the wake of technology seem more like a distraction uh, than, than ever before, in, in my view. Um, so I'm very, very concerned about the fourth industrial revolution. I'm very concerned that uh, nations all around the world have been brought into the fold um, by financial coercion and, and ideological possession. Uh, and we, we've kind of just ceded the territory that, hey, we don't need borders anymore. We're past borders. And, and there's a huge existential error in that. And, and people think that borders, especially in the black community, we, we get this very wrong. We think that borders were just these arbitrary lines that were drawn by political means uh, to separate nations and armies. And that is a lot of what borders represent. That is a lot of what borders have functioned as. But in a spiritual sense, in an existential sense, borders represent a limit, a boundary to man's unfettered ambitions. And this is why we see globalism and technology merge into one driving force one driving, one driving uh, agenda that means to bastardize everybody's individuality. And they say it's for the collective, 
but but collectively, we're not getting better. Collectively, our, our overall health as a society is not better. And the fourth industrial revolution is very unabashed about their their designs, about their agenda uh, and, and their willingness to undermine and circumvent the truth to execute. I'm so glad you brought this up and I'm glad Anthony's here. I'm going to throw this out to both of you. I want Anthony to go first. Royce brings up this technology has made the world smaller and we're all connected. And we all, I can remember thinking that was a good thing. When the internet first started, I was like, oh man, this is cool. But, but then I think like, hold on, we were scattered across the globe by design and, and now we're, we're losing. I don't know if I want to be connected to India or China or any of the, that don't respect my values and I see us starting, well, we got to get rid of this to fit in with this. And, and, and so a place like Israel that's like really pro LGBTQ, I don't want their cultural influence. Canada, they're outlawing scriptures in the Bible as hate speech. I don't want those values here. I wonder how it's, God seemed like he scattered us for a reason, yet, and, and we seem to be like, nah, nah. Let's reduce all, but we're just all one big nation. So the scattering was for a reason from God's standpoint, and that is to impart his dominion over the world. He wants his imprint all over the world, but we've taken the things that we've created, that we've created, and we want to make that imprint on the world. The problem is, as you've pointed out, Everybody's got their own little corner and nobody's really identifying weight. But does this align with any truth? Is there anything substantive about this or is it just my own identity? And when we leave man up to his own devices, he will worship himself in some kind of form or fashion. So if we're not using God as the imprint, if we're not using God as the mode that we use, then it's going to come back to us. We're going to worship self. Royce, I'm going to give you a final say, but I want you to react to, you know, his point about self-worship. And yeah. that's what I see in society in terms of like, hey, I have these desires. And so I don't care what the Bible says. I have these desires. So they must be good <laughs> and they must be met. And that comes from self-worship. Yeah. Idolatry, you make your own self an idol yep. rather than God. Anyway, I, I just want your reaction to anything I just put on the table or Anthony said. Well, you know, if you look at these things across a wide enough span of history, you could argue that the color television revolution was actually a revolution, was actually revolt against God, and, and that the color television um, as, a, as a technological advancement was the precondition. It was actually the precondition for iconism, right, uh, and, and for us to to sort of warp our mentality around icons. And and you can actually look at the the the, the trend downwards of Christian identity, of people who identify as Christians in America and the color te television uh, phenomenon uh, are perfectly aligned. And now, technology, social media took what color television. Um, what, what color television introduced and has ex expanded it to the widest range possible. Um, now it's not the obsession of, of celebrities, but it's for all of us to become our own little celebrity uh, in our own little world, I even if it's not really grounded in reality. Uh, and, and that's the real scary part is that the next iteration of the fourth industrial revolution is to completely warp reality where you can, where you can tailor the settings of your virtual world and get all of the adoration or adulation or or dopamine that you desire uh, and truly become your own God. I mean, there, there's something there's something deeply heretical about it, number one, but there's something anti-human about it, too. And I think a lot of the people who claim to be um, on the, you know, on the come for uh, human, human welfare or humanitarianism, uh, have have blatantly overlooked how anti-human this fourth industrial revolution really is. I mean, how long? Let, let's take the baby farms for example, right? How long before they're just making babies and the babies are born into slavery? I mean, who's gonna who's gonna watch over it? 
How do you watch over it? Right. This is the ma- this is actually the Matrix story playing out before our very eyes. And what they'll have you believe is, oh, you know, n- nobody is going to just, you know, uh, uh, clone babies into slavery. We're way past something like that. It'll never happen. Uh, and it, it it won't happen under the auspices of, of the last iteration of slavery. But there'll be a new justification for it. Right. It's like, hey, we need cobalt. We need lithium. We need lithium to have electric electric vehicles. We need lithium to have iPhones so everybody can have equal opportunity access to the Internet. We need these things. And if, if the people who are on the planet right now don't want to work in the cobalt mines, well, maybe we just even the playing field by taking these parentless children that we've created over in this farm and have them mine the lithium. Because really, they're not even human to us. We're not even human to the powers that be anymore. They're pretty soon there will be no human. Uh, and, and that's that's a scary proposition. Royce, I'm on, I need 90 seconds because we're going to have to follow up on this next week. But I need you for 90 seconds to unpack the color television and its impact. Just just give me a little bit more on that and give the audience a little bit more on that so we can marinate on it over the weekend and circle back to you next week. Well, I mean, look, when we were a black and white TV and there were a few channels, um, you know, th- there was a there was a constraint on on what we saw, what we saw icons as how we worshipped, uh, how we how we interacted with what we were presented content wise. When we got to color television, uh, there was this impetus to expand the, the scope of television altogether. And then it was cable television. And then you have and then you have a, a sort of a watershed moment of radical celebrity, right? So, you know, when it was black and white, there was a disconnect between the the people who lived in a real color world and that this is television. This isn't real because it's black and white. We live in the real color world. When we see the world today, we think of that time period as being in black and white, but in real life, it obviously wasn't. When color television came, it became reality. The celebrity became reality. The, the icons became tangible. You could be a, a celebrity. And then now we're we're at a digital virtual stage where everybody wants to be Kim Kardashian. Everybody wants to be The Bachelor. Everybody's living their own little version of of Survivor or, or you know, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or or whatever the case may be. Uh, and it's it's anti God at the heart of it. Mm. Thank you, Royce. Great job. Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell, he's going to bat last for us. Steve Kim, next. Batting last but not least, I'll probably get hit with a racial discrimination suit for making Steve Kim go last. we did have a white guy earlier, TJ Moe, so Steve, you can't. Anyway, Steve, don't be offended by that you're last in the order. You know you're at least our seventh or eighth best contributor. So uh, anyway, what's your vision for 23? Well, the particular interest of mine, as we talked about, what would I do for 2023? I'm going to be here. My vision is to be the Asian Bowie Kuhn. I want to be the college football commissioner. We got to fix something here. We got to fix the infrastructure of college football, and we tie it in to the NIL, the transfer portal, and the postseason slash playoff. Now, this is my recommendation, and this is just a baseline. Number one, if we're going to go full pro, let's not be half pregnant. College football now is a billion dollar business. They're trying to make it into a professional league with universities involved. So you know what? Let's go all the way with players. Players wanted to get paid. You know what? Let's pay them. Let's put them under binding contracts. So first step, the letter of intent, something that you had long ago at Ball State. But you know what I would do? Instead of making them one-year renewables, when you first get into college, you make them a two-year contract. So this way, nobody transfers after three games and they don't want to be redshirted or they just want to quit and get poached by another school. In the first two years, the school and the player is bound to themselves. Now, with that, unless the player and the university or program agree that you can transfer, 
if you do transfer, that comes with the one-year sit-out period. You cannot just leave and go to another school. I think the universities and the programs and the coaches, they deserve to have some continuity within their roster. Now, all the NILs, hearing a lot of hearing a lot of like nightmare scenarios where guys are not getting their money. In other words, the NILs are becoming the null and voids. Uh-uh. Let's guarantee all the money. We're making them in the contracts. And half of the money will be delivered upon graduation or completion of eligibility or both. This way, we at least have an impetus for these guys to get their education, which, by the way, they're still getting for free. Does everyone want to talk about the cost of a free education? All right. Now, with that said, since we are making this professional, we just can't have five or six guys get all the money. The players need to unionize and have a collective bargaining where there are team NIL deals where every single player from the star quarterback to the backup long snapper, they get a baseline of an NIL deal. Certain teams have this where everybody at least gets something and the star players get a little bit more. Now, here's what I would do to eradicate the, I would say, the apathy of the bowl season. Jason, I don't know about you. I love college football. But as soon as it turns to December, all the way up until about New Year's, I don't care about the bowl games. It's the strangest dynamic is that everything's tied into the regular season and two games. So here's what we're going to do in honor of the late, great Mike Leach. By the way, moment of silence. Okay. But he said we should do a 64-team tournament. I thought the pirate was crazy, God rest his soul. <laughs> oh, oh, I hear scoffing. Here but you let go. Me, Here let you me go. explain why. Let me explain why. Because all these games. These, no way. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Don't, Dave, you know what? Do not go skip Bayless on me. I am not doing it. But see, here's, what, here's my thinking. <laughs> all these bowl games that we don't care about, you know what? You know how we care about them? Make them in the playoff games. Because all these games from, like, December 9th all the way to about December 26th, they're all just programming. So why not just shorten the regular season, make every game a conference game, all right, and then we'll reseed them and just make it like the pros and make it your version of March Madness. Now, certain people say, well, what about the players? You're really going to make them play that many games? Yes, but since they are professionals, there will be a reward. Every single round you go to, you get a winner share and a loser share. So you stack up a couple of victories, tell you what, you're going to be able to buy that biology book that you're never going to crack open anyway. So there you have it right there. <laughs> Vote for Steve Kim. I can do it right. I will save college football. You will care about the regular season as much as the postseason. And the players, all of them, will get paid. You want to make it professional football, hey, be careful what you ask for. But that is the platform of the Korean yeah. Bowie Cup. All si You lost me at all 64 teams or 64 got. teams. <laughs> Look, they 32. need to win eight games to even be eligible, in my opinion, yes. for a bowl game uh -huh. instead of all these mediocre teams. And then you know what the – did you see the Michigan running back that was hurt, that was on crutches during the game? I can't think of his name. Blake, Blake Corum. Corum. Blake Corum. Yeah, Blake Corum. Yeah. That, he's, he told you what the players are spending their NIL money on. That gold chain he had on with all the diamonds looked like it cost about $250,000. And so I don't need to be helping these kids blow their money. Uh, you know, the whole NIL. I, I, some of your idea I liked. 64 team playoff, no dice. Anthony's a big sports fan, and he'd probably love a 64 team no. playoff because the Tennessee Titans would maybe qualify. <laughs> uh, but any, your, your thoughts on any of this, Boo? Anthony, you got any thoughts on any of this? Yeah. I, I was with him up until he got to the 64 playoffs. <laughs> All that other stuff, he was, he was doing real well. And maybe since he's going to be commissioner, you know, you're not going to get everything you want anyway. So yeah. they'll right. probably hire him and they just say, we can't do the 64 uh, January madness <laughs> playoff game he's going to have. January and, well, and, uh, January and February <laughs> right. madness is what that would be. They're playing college football <laughs> in spring camp in March. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I, I would also say another thing, uh, another addendum. If you opt to sit out and you're healthy, you should get docked. I mean, these guys want to be treated like professionals and have professional responsibilities, which comes with obligations. All right. Are, are you docking? Uh, are you docking Shannon Sharp's pay for skipping uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Undisputed on Tuesday? 
No, to the contrary, I'm giving him a bonus because that's about the only time that we give a doggone about that sacred program. He made that thing go viral. I, I think there's a bonus. Because most of that time, most of the time, that show is a snoozer. Let's be honest. 60-14 right. playoff. Thank no you, go, Steve. Huh? Let's cue up some All harmony. Right. And we'll get out of here. That's your first appearance on Tennessee Harmony, Steve. Uh, next time we'll get you to mention Jesus. All right, cue up Harmony. We'll see you next week. How did we end up so divided? One united Now we're headed for downfall God let your light shine down What we need more than anything now Harmony Let's make a simple vow Let's come together now Harmony Put all your weapons down Love one another now Harmony Time for us to wait Tell